of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Lord we just thank you for how great you are we thank you that we don't serve God that was shaped by human hands. But we don't serve a, a series of gods or an angry God or an or a untouchable God. We serve a great God who paid a great price. And we look forward, oh God, to the day, Lord, you break the sky open with your glory. And you call us home. You call us up. and proclaim your name. Lord, help us not to let the holy become ordinary. Help us not to let the awesome things, the awesome truths of your word become dull to us. But Lord, help all of our hearts to truly think and truly think how great you are. How great you are. As we go into the time of the preaching of your word, Lord, we just pray that you will Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to introduce a man who needs no introduction. He's been here several times before, giving us missional updates. This morning, he's going to be preaching the word. Would you give a hearty Antioch welcome for Brother Jason Hamilton? Come on up here. I call him Buff because he's Buff and he's got the stuff. Amen. Give him, give him an open heart and open ears as he preaches. I think so. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right. Well, it's good to see all of you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good to see all of your faces again. Um, I'm just thankful for this church and thank you for your hospitality for us. You always make us feel so welcome when we're here. So thanks to Dave and Laura for having us here. Thanks to Gary and his wife for opening up their home to us, their beautiful home. They let us have a whole run of their house. So it's been a great time staying in their home and, and being there. I'm so glad to be here with you. My wife is here. I delayed in my, my daughter Dallas, and my son Austin is there. I want to show you something. I'm going to show you the cutest thing you're going to see all year. <laughs> Austin, come here, buddy. Come here. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Oh. Okay, okay. All right, all right. All right. I want you to smile. Last, last time when I came last year, he was really tiny. Okay, look. Can you show everybody? Wow. That's cute, too. All right. Okay, never mind. <laughs> He's not used to seeing so many white people. <laughs> yeah, living in, living in Malaysia, he's not used to seeing all your white faces, so... Sorry about that. Couldn't get my child to perform one cue this morning. But uh, if, you, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I serve as a, as a missionary in Malaysia. I've been there, beginning next year, it'll be 10 years, which is hard to believe. I've been there that long. Uh, it just feels like, you know, I took the flight and landed over there last week. It's, it seems so new and fresh, but it'll be nearly a decade, which means I'm only you know, 37 years old, so a quarter of my life has been spent you know, living in, uh, in Malaysia on the mission field. Met my wife there, and, uh, you know, with my, thinking about my wife, and we were, we were 
praying for our brother who is in the law enforcement, going for this uh, protect on this rally, this, this race rally. S- speaking as someone who is in an interracial marriage, there is nothing more idiotic than, than judging someone based on their race, their ethnicity. It is just, it's so dumb. <laughs> because, you know, speaking as someone who is in an interracial marriage, my wife is just as a sinner as I am. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter where she's from. Or my passport or whatever it is, we're both people who are lousy people that need a Savior, amen? amen? And we need to pray for that whole situation and pray that somehow in the midst of all that, Christ will be glorified, amen? amen. Uh, just to give you a short update of what's going on on the mission field, my, my, the name of the ministry is the Bridge Foundation, and the point of the Bridge Foundation is helping to support local pastors and leaders on the, on the, on, in, in those nations and where I serve. It's not uh, supporting other missionaries, but supporting the local pastors and leaders. And you are very familiar with that, especially through India. You guys have worked a lot with that, with Dave going to India many times. He's been there more times than I have now, actually. He's gone so many times. And that ministry now in India has become self-supporting. It has become now where we can let it go and they can do their own thing. We don't have to be behind them financially anymore. They have their own uh, way to support themselves. So that's a success story of something that's going on in the field right here from our little church here. Amen? So you're having an impact on nations around the world. And another uh, nation that I'm involved in is in Cambodia. Cambodia is just next to Vietnam. And in Cambodia, also supporting local leaders and pastors there. And uh, the, this past, past year, Antioch has helped to provide Bibles for uh, the Christians that are there, bought 100 Bibles for the pastors and leaders that are there. Now, when I say pastors and leaders, you think of people, you know, like my age and Dave age are older, he needs older people. But some of these leaders that are in this church are 13, 14 years old. <laughs> yes, they are. Pastor Kundate is the pastor that the British Foundation supports there in Cambodia, and he does outreaches into the villages. And what he does is he does outreach to the children and the teenagers. And that's who he's reaching out to. And he knows when he reaches out to them, they will be able to reach out to their parents and their families at home. And that's why you have leaders who are leading cell groups, who are leading home churches that are 13 years old, 14 years old. They get out of school at the end of the day, and they're going to the village to go and preach the gospel. Those are the people that we bought Bibles for, because many of them did not even have Bibles. They were using photocopied pages. They were using handwritten Bible pages to be able to preach the gospel from. So we were able to put Bibles in their hands. And we bought, uh, this is the second set of time we bought Bibles for them, uh, for the different leaders, because there just wasn't enough. But now we have, all of them have a Bible, everyone has what they need. And one of the, the outreaches they use when they go into the villages is they teach English as well. And so the Bible that we gave them is a, what do you call that? Parallel Bible. Part of it's in Cambodian, part of it's in English. So when they're teaching in the English, they're teaching in the Bible. <laughs> So it's a great resource for them spiritually, for themselves, for ministry, but also as an outreach tool as they teach these kids English. You're also teaching them the Bible. So thank you, Antioch, for being behind this ministry. You're having impact on nations that you'll never be, you'll never meet these people from, but you're having great impact on those places. So thank you so much for supporting the Bridge Foundation. So y'all come and see me sometime, all right? Come to Malaysia, come to Cambodia. I'll take you there. What I want to do, I want to share from you, share from the Word of God, and there is something that that is part of, almost for many of us, part of our everyday life, and that's something called worry. Worry. Hey, you want to come up here now, buddy? Now you're excited to come on up. (laughs) It's worry, and even now as we're thinking about this, this rally that's going to happen again in in Charlottesville, we worry. We think, what's going to happen? Is there going to be more violence? Is there going to be more nonsense going on? And our daily lives are, have no shortage of the opportunities to have fear and have worry. There's no shortage of that. The media perpetuates it. We turn on the television nonstop. It is, here's something else you can worry about. Here's something else you can be fearful of. Here's something else that you can worry in, about for your children. When one thing comes and goes, another takes its place, right? You know, we, we had a few years ago, it was the SARS disease, NH1N1, and then the bird flu, and then the swine flu, and... Who knows what flu is coming next? Mad cow disease, mad chicken, whatever. Something else is going to happen. One thing goes, something else replaces it to make us fear. But we as believers, we must not succumb to a culture 
of fear and worry. We cannot. My response to fear, our response to fear must be to attack it in our life. We have to nail it, cast it out before it ever has the chance to dig in in our lives. Because fear can take root in your life and cripple you. It can. And some of us have had that in our lives, where fear has crippled us. If we don't, the newspaper headline will become another brick of fear in the fortress of terror in our life. We must enforce a zero-tolerance policy against fear in our life. You know, our, our current government administration, is, has, our president is instituting a lot of zero-tolerance policies on certain things. But we have to have that same zero-tolerance policy on fear in our minds, on worry in our life, because it, can, it is one of the things that can hold us down so much in our spiritual life, in our physical life, in our emotional life, so many things. Fear is a big deal. Yeah. And it's a habit. Worry is a habit, just like any other habit you can have. Yeah. You know, you can have a habit of biting your nails. You can have a habit of whatever it is. Worry is a habit, and it's a habit that must and can be broken. It can be broken, just like any other habit. The truth is, worry will kill you. Worry will kill you. Our mind and our body was not created to worry, but to trust in God. That's how we were created. God didn't create us, and when he created Adam and Eve, to let them go in the garden and say, I hope they just worry every day how they're going to get their food and how they're going to eat and all these different things. No. He created them with full trust and knowing that he will provide everything that they need. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a what? Sound mind. A sound mind. A worried mind is not a sound mind. A worried mind is not a sound mind. It is a troubled, unpeaceful, unbelief-filled mind. Think about this. One of my favorite verses, and something that until this day, it's hard to get your mind around it, but in uh in 1 Corinthians 2.16, Paul is telling us that we have the mind of Christ. And that's hard to get your mind around. Oh, wow, I have the mind of Christ. And that's one of those times you just trust and believe what the Word says. But I have the mind of Christ. Do you think that Christ's mind is full of worry? Do you think that Christ's mind is full of fear and doubt and unbelief? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. When Jesus was speaking forth the words that created this universe. There was no fear in those words. There was no doubt. I wonder if I say this, if the earth will create. <laughs> no, there was none of that. There was no unbelief. It was full of faith and belief and trust and power. When your thought life, when your thought life is terrorizing you, stand on God's word that you have the mind of Christ and will not be tormented by fear and worry. It's a, it's a promise from the word of God that we have the mind of Christ and that we can stand on in those times when our mind is just tormenting us. Fear is tormenting us. We can say, I have the mind of Christ. I will not worry. I will not have fear. I have a sound mind, as it says in Timothy. There's a, there's a doctor. She is a uh, neurosurgeon. Her name is Dr. Caroline Leaf. She is a, a uh, neurosurgeon and a brain surgeon. She's also a born-again believer. And she talks about uh, how she's done extensive brain uh, study about how worry and fear in your mind and toxic thinking cause literal brain damage. Not just, you know, emotional and all those things, but it can cause literal brain damage in your brain. And I read through how she explained it. I still don't understand how it all works. But I don't know how I got out of that is what she's saying is it can cause literal brain damage. When you fear and constant fear and worry, it affects how your brain functions. It can, and when your brain starts working in a uh, different way, that can alter everything that you do. A thought may seem harmless, but if it becomes toxic, even just a thought can become physically, emotionally, or spiritually dangerous. There's a massive body of research that, that shows uh, collectively that 80%, 80% of physical, emotional, and mental health issues today could be a direct result of our thought lives. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. The things that we even, fo even things that we face physically in our life, can we can find root in our thought life and fear and in worry and all of those things, things like unforgiveness. There's a whole long line of things that come from our minds, but they affect us in so many ways. 
But there is hope. You know, this all sounds so depressing, but there is hope. You can break the cycle of toxic thinking with the word of God, the word of God, and start build healthy patterns that bring peace to a stormy thought life. The word of God is the answer, and it's always the answer. What is the problem? It's in the word of God. If there's anything I've learned in, in all the years I went to Bible college and all these things, is just read your Bible more. <laughs> Get in the word. <laughs> Some of us deal with fear and worry by seeing what the word feed, the world feeds us and we allow it to develop. You know, the world, we watch the news, we read the newspaper, we get on our Facebook, our phone, all these things is feeding us all these things to worry about. And it's not saying we shouldn't care about things. That's not what we're, we don't ignore bad things that are happening in the world. We don't ignore them, but we don't have to allow, allow that fear to take root in our life. Some of us, and then honestly, some of us deal with real Mental and biological issues that cause us to be a constant, weir, constant war with fear and worry. Okay? Some of us have real issues. I'm not downplaying depression. I'm not downplaying other biological issues. Those are real things that people deal with. But I tell you today, you don't have to be a victim of your biology. You don't have to be a victim of those things. God has given us a design of hope, and the best medicine is in the Word of God. The promises of God. In the eternal sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, Jesus conquered the grave. He can handle what's going on in our minds, right? He can handle those things. He can handle what's going on in Charlottesville. He can handle those things. He created the universe. The Bible tells us that the the waters of the earth are in the hollow of his hand. That's how big and strong our God is. He can handle what's going on in our lives. We can renew our minds to change and heal. If you deal with fear, if you deal with worry, if you deal with these things, we can deal with it. We can renew it, renew our minds through the word. Philippians 4, if you have your Bible, turn to Philippians 4, verse 6 through 9. This is a famous verse, passage, dealing with what we're talking about this morning. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. It says, don't worry about anything. That's the best. You can stop right there. Amen. Let's go home. (laughs) Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. I love that, uh, these promises from the word about, and this, what we should focus on, of what our minds should be set on. It says, near, brothers, and it says, fix your thoughts on what is true. I love the King James. It says, it says, set your mind on these things. Set your mind on these things. They are honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and true, trustworthy, all of these things. Those are the things we should set our minds on. Not the things that the media wants to feed us, that our, the enemy wants to feed us, that Satan wants to put in our minds. All of these things focus on this. The peace of God comes from knowing that he will take care of you. There is a a scripture in Hebrews that says we should labor to rest. What does that mean, labor to rest? That means work just to know that God is taking care of you. There is a a lot of uh, preaching out there that has to do with faith and, you know, all of this stuff. And some of it's good, some of it's nonsense. But I tell you, the highest level of faith is just rest when you can just know God will take care of it. That's the highest level of faith. When I don't have to scream in prayer and claim it in Jesus' name and all those kind of things, I can just rest and know that God's going to take care of it. To me, that's the highest level of faith. And that's when fear and worry will never be able to get into my mind because I'm resting and knowing that God is taking care of whatever that thing I need to be taken care of. Peace of God comes from knowing that he will take care of you. The direct instruction from the word is don't worry about anything. That's the first one there in verse 4. That doesn't mean being careless, that we don't go day by day, just not 
taking precautions and all that stuff, but it means knowing that God is in control. Amen? He is in control. So we must train ourselves to immediately act whenever fear comes knocking. So whenever we hear these thoughts come in our mind, whenever fear and worry wants to take root in our lives, we have to act immediately on it. We must learn to do what Jesus did. Confront fear and cast it out. Put fear on the run, just like Jesus did. James 4, 7, one of my favorite promises from the word, again, says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It doesn't say he might flee from you. He will, after a little while, flee from you. It just says he will flee from you. Since Satan is at the root of, of all fear and worry, Satan is at the root of all fear and worry. We can say, resist fear, and then fear will flee from you. Or we can say, resist worry, and worry will flee from you. Flee, if you look it up, it says, is defined as running away as in terror. That's what flee is. You're running scared to death. <laughs> That's what fleeing is. So we put the devil on the run. When we, we resist him, he will flee. You know, think about it. Why, why are terrorists called terrorists. Like we're, of all the names they could have been called, why are they called terrorists? Because it is their duty in life, it is their job to strike terror and put fear in the hearts of people to get what they want. That's what Satan does. He wants to put fear and terror in your heart to get what he wants. But we can be terrorists right back to him and put him on the run and make him flee from our lives. You, know, you remember, we all can probably attest, you remember the bully in school. There was, there was one or maybe 10 of them, but there was a bully in school. As long as he was allowed to intimidate people, he got what he wanted. But the moment someone stood up and challenged him, he'd back off. That's right. Deep down, every bully is a coward. Yeah. Satan is a coward. <laughs> he knows he can't get things when he needs directly, so he goes these roundabout ways to put thoughts in your mind, to put fear and worry and shame and all of these things because he's a coward. Resist him and he will flee. Think about the, our famous you know, Sunday school story, David and Goliath, the one we teach our little kids. Goliath was the ultimate bully. <laughs> he was the biggest dude in town. He could scare everybody. He had the entire army of Israel frozen in a state of fear. Just one man had them all shaken in their boots until David showed up. David stood toe-to-toe, face-to-face with the one thing that was terrifying Israel. But David knew he had, he had a defense. The covenant-keeping God of Israel was with him. The same God that's with you and me. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he's with you as well. Fear was confronted and defeated, and its head was removed and displayed for all to see. It's, such a, it's so funny we teach that. You know, it's not funny, but we teach that story to our you know, kids in Sunday school. But that is a vicious, violent story, man. <laughs> Cutting off the head of that dude. And here it is, everybody. As a result, the word says that the Philistine army ran in terror. What is run in terror? Flee. The same promise that we have from James. It says Satan will do the same thing when we resist him. Just like if we cut off his head and displayed it for everyone to see. David, with his unwavering trust in God, put fear on the run. He resisted, and the enemy fled. Jesus, of course, is our ultimate example. Jesus is our ultimate example of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with fear. He combated Satan himself in the desert with the word of God when he said over and over, it is written, it is written. Jesus stood up in the boat during the storm and confronted fear, saying, peace, be still. Jesus stood up against death and confronted the evil report to Jairus, saying, fear not, believe only. Jesus stood up to a legion of devils running toward him at Gadara. <laughs> Just basically stopped there and said, come out of him, you unclean spirit. Got rid of fear with words. Jesus confronted and resisted fear. He is our example. He is the one we follow. He is the one that shows us how we do things, and we can do the same. You say, well, that's Jesus. Remember, that's the same, the same Holy Spirit that created the earth, the same Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost like a rushing wind, the same Holy Spirit that worked through Lazarus to raise him from the dead is living within you if you were a born-again believer. You don't have to doubt. You can doubt yourself all day long, but you cannot doubt the God that is living inside of you. 
You and I can confront and resist fear and worry the very same way that Jesus did by speaking faith-filled words that are backed up by the word of God. Not just speaking your own words. You get out of here, you big mean man. No, you find what the word says, the promise that, and the word for your situation, and you resist the devil that way. Find the promise from the word. So what fears are you facing today? What fear are you facing today? What is causing you unending worry? What bully has you terrified? What keeps you up at night or occupies your thoughts to an unhealthy level? Some, all of us to, at some point, to some degree, to some level, have something that causes us worry. Some of us have it way up here to a very unhealthy degree. Some of us have a little bit, but we all deal with something that causes us to worry. What is that thing that's causing you to worry? Is it the world situation? Is it the economy? Is it your health? You're dealing with a health situation that's causing you just nonstop worry? Is it the, the future of your children? You don't know what, what this knucklehead son of mine is doing. I don't know what road he's going down, and you worry and you worry. Is it your business? You worry if it's going to be able to compete with the other businesses or as online all this stuff goes on? Is it Islam and ISIS? Do you worry about those things? Is it disease and epidemics? Your job situation, do you worry about it? Or your lack of a job situation, do you worry about it? A bad investment you've made? Your spouse? A major decision for your family's future? The future of this church? Is there something that causes you worry and fear? There's nothing wrong with being concerned about things, but to it gets to a point where you worry and fear, it can become unhealthy. Stand up to fear, no matter what it is. Cast down worry, oppose it, resist it, attack it. Face to face, put fear on the run. Your mind was not created for fear. Amen. It was created to worship him, to know him, and to walk in faith for his kingdom, not to fear and worry. Because God doesn't do that. He's not sitting up in heaven wringing his hands. I wonder if everything's okay down there. No, he's not worried like that. We shouldn't be either. We have to speak to that fear in our life. And you'll feel so silly, don't it? <laughs> but when you start to do it and you speak to that fear in your life, I'm telling you, you see results. You speak to the fear in your life. You say, fear in the name of Jesus. The Bible tells me that if I resist you, Satan, if I resist you, you will flee. You have no place in my home. You speak to it. I'm telling you, it works. Because why? You're speaking the word of God. The word of God is the will of God. Okay? Anytime you're speaking out the word of God, when you're putting the word of God into action in your life, you're putting the will of God into action in your life. And the words that we use when we're speaking against, they're not just simply spoken. They're backed up by the eternal word of God that is ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a real covenant. God gave us a Bible full of promises. He gave us this word that is full of promises that can cover any situation you'll face in life. There is nothing that you will face that the word does not have an answer for. And you're probably thinking in your mind already, what about this, what about that? I'm telling you, there is nothing that you can face in life that the word does not have an answer for. And I dare you to find something that doesn't. He, God provided for us a weapon in the word that is bigger than any weapon of mass destruction the enemy could come up with, <laughs> bigger than any disease, bigger than anything, any economy that can fall, anything that may cause us worry. This word has the promise to deal with it. Amen? Amen. And all that fails, you don't know the word of God, you, just, you can stand on this fact, Jesus dealt with it on the cross. <laughs> just know that. <laughs> If you are dealing with a health issue, and you know, you know that you know, you don't know the word that you, as well as you should, but here's the one thing you should know. Jesus deal with it on the cross. Put faith on what Jesus did for you on the cross. Just like he died for your sins, just like he did all those other things, he did it for our bodies as well. Now, here's another thing that will step on your toes a little bit. Worry is one of the worst sins a believer can commit. Worry is one of the worst sins a believer can commit. Why? So why? Why, had, why in the world is that a sin in the first place? Not just a sin, but one of the worst. Because it's directly opposite of what the Lord has commanded us to do. When he said, fear not, and then you say, fear yes. 
when he told us to not worry about where your food and your, all these things are going to come from. But we do the opposite. We fear and we worry. Because what it is is placing our trust in something else besides the Lord. That's what fear is. When you fear, you're saying, how am I going to do this? And right there is your answer. You can't. When we need to rely on the Lord. Yes, we, God gives us ability. He gives us strength. He gives us a mind. He gives us all those things to work those things out. But we put those under the Lordship of Christ to show us what to do with those abilities he's given us. That's why worry is a terrible sin. <laughs> because it puts our trust in something else besides the Lord. And it's direct opposite of what he's told us to do. We saw in Philippians 4 earlier that we are supposed to set our minds on, and the basis of those things comes from Joshua 1, 8, and 9. You can turn there. I'll just read it to you. It says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it in it day and night. We talk, in Philippians 4, it told us all those things we should meditate on, right? What is good, what is lovely, what is pure. And he's the root of that, the basis, the foundation comes from this. You shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is in the Old Testament. That he is with you wherever you go. And then when Jesus left again, when he gave the Great Commission, he said, what? To go into the, all the world, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what? Lo, I will be with you always. I think one of the funniest prayers that we pray, which is always in good intention, we send our youth group away to camp, Lord, go with them. He's there. He's also here. <laughs> He's everywhere at all times. He's always with us. Wherever we go, the Lord is with us. There is no place that we can go where he is not. He is always with us. Worry is the opposite of this command. Worry is the opposite. Instead of meditating on the covenant promises of God, worry dwells on two things. Worry has two things it dwells on. It dwells on the lies of the devil, and it dwells on our, our own power and ability to solve our problems. That's what worry is. Worry either dwells on the lies of the enemy or it dwells on our own ability to solve our problems. And, and, you know, when worry focuses on the lies of the enemy, it says you're sick or you're, you'll forever be in debt <laughs> well, your kids will never come to know Christ or this church is never going to grow or, or you know, all these different things. You'll always be depressed. You'll always be single. <laughs> all these things that will come in your mind. That's what fear is. It comes from the lies of the enemy. Or it comes from our, our own th dwelling on our own ability to solve our own problems. How am I going to take care of this? What am I going to do? Without ever thinking, should I consult the Lord? <laughs> do I think maybe the one who created the universe might have an answer for me? The word of God that he's given? The word is so important. We can find answers and guidance in the word. I remember when I first became a believer in I'd hear people say, they would give up, stand up and give a testimony. They'd say, the Lord said this to me. And I felt the Lord lead me this way. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> God spoke to them? Like, how did that ever happen? You know, that, that, that was so strange to me as a new believer. And maybe you have had that before. Maybe you've never felt anything like that before. But the fact is, even if you never have that inner witness of the Holy Spirit, if you never hear the voice of the Lord, you can find him faithful. Why? Because of this. He has given you the word of God because anything that he will so-called speak to you is already in here. It will always be, always already be in the word. Remember what Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. That's how we hear through the word of God. And the opposite can be true with fear and worry. You know, fear comes by hearing <laughs> and fear comes by hearing and the devil will get into your mind with that thing, with uh, fear as well, but you constantly dwelling on what he is saying or what the media is saying or whatever. So what does the word say about receiving deliverance from this habit of worry? What does the word say? Well, Jesus put it in its place in Mark 4, 18 and 19. He said, now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and take the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering to choke the word and becomes unfruitful. The Amplified Bible says the cares of this world or the cares and anxieties of this world. 
the, the, the NLT says the worries of this life. These are things that we all deal with, right? There's worries of life. So what's Jesus showing here? The cares of this world, a.k.a. worry and fear, choke the word in our lives and it becomes unfruitful. When we allow fear and worry to become more dominant in our life than the place that the word has, it begins to choke out the word in our life. Just like when you plant a garden and you don't take care of it and the weeds come and they're choking out your tomatoes and they're choking out your flowers, they choke them out. It's the same thing with fear and worry in our life. This is why daily consumption of the word is so important, to be in the word every day. Even if you're just reading a verse, something, get in the word every day. Make it a part of your daily habit. Get in the word daily so that God's promises are hidden in your heart and you're immediately ready to combat the toxic thoughts of the enemy. Don't wait till the problem comes to find out what the word says about it. Have it already hidden in your heart. Have it in your mind. Have it on your mouth. So when the problem comes, you're ready to face it with the word. The, the, what's the, the old saying that uh, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure? <laughs> right? If you're right there preventing it with the word, it's better than trying to deal with it when the problem comes. When, it's, when you go to the doctor and he says, you've got cancer, and you're like, oh, God, what does the word say? And you can still, believe me, you can still rely on the word. You can still rely on what God says. But it's better to be ahead of time ready to know what the word says, what God's promises already are when those bad, that bad news comes. Amen? Amen? Even though God has redeemed us from the curse, which includes worry and fear and doubt and unbelief and all of these things, it must be resisted by faith. We must resist it. It's a daily thing. Just like when you were born again, you never... It's not like you never had to deal with sin again, right? <laughs> it, was still, it was still there. Fear and worry will still be there, but we have to deal with it by, the, by faith. And faith comes by how? Hearing the word of God, getting in the word, by hearing and hearing the word of God. Mark 4.20, but these are the ones sown on good ground. So we talked about the bad ground. These are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60 and 100. What fruit? What is the fruit? The fruit of victory in our life. The fruit, of, the fruit of a life devoid of worry and fear. The fruit of not being consumed with fear from every bad report that comes along. Some people look for things to worry about. <laughs> there are times in my life I can say, I was probably like that. Where I was just looking for something to worry about. Everything is going good in my life. I better find something I should be worried about, right? It's something that, that's very unhealthy. Galatians 3, the just shall live by faith, not live by fear, not live by worry. We live by faith. So where do we go from here? All of this information, where do we go from here? We start by obeying what the Father has said in his word. When Jairus, you remember that story of Jesus and Jairus? Jesus told Jairus to stop the fear, and he fully intended for him to do it. All he told him was, fear not, believe only. Remember, Jesus was on his way to somewhere else. Jairus comes saying what's going on in his family. Jesus is like, I got places to go, but fear not, believe only. <laughs> He's just telling him, truth, just believe, man, believe. And I think that's such a good window into what faith is. Because Jesus, was, he was busy. At that time, when he was on earth, he was one man by himself. And he was focused to go somewhere else. And he knew he had this one window to say something to this guy. What did he say? He's on his way, speed walking to where he's got to go. Just fear not, believe only. And that's such a good window of how, what we, how we should walk in our life. Just don't fear. Believe God will take care of it. It doesn't mean we don't have to be concerned. We don't focus on it, but we don't have to fear. We can believe God. <clears throat> I heard someone say one time that we have, we have two correct responses to God's promises and commands in the Bible. They are yes and thank you. <laughs> Those are the only two correct responses to his promises and his commands. Yes, and thank you. And I think that's a, uh, a good thing to remember when you come across some scripture that doesn't sit well with you or what you sh how you should live your life or how I should live to say yes and thank you. That's how we deal with it in our life. Because why? God's promises are yes and amen. So we just say yes and thank you to what he's told us. So how do we get rid of this worry? Bringing this all together. How do we get... How do we get rid of worry? First, we recognize what it is. We recognize what it is. Worry is just another word for fear. 
okay? It's just another word for fear. We say, oh, I'm worried about my son. No, you are in fear, okay? You're in fear. Worry is just another word for fear, and fear has no place in the life of a born-again, blood-bought, spirit-filled, believing Christian. There is no place for fear in our life. When a thought contrary to the word comes into your mind, immediately recognize what it is and begin the process to deal with it. We have to recognize what fear is. I think I'm getting sick. What if I can't pay this bill? My son is never going to get his life right. My wife hates me. I'm not sure if God really loves me. Recognize the lies of the enemy in your mind and in your life. Begin to recognize what that fear and worry is. Recognize the words of the enemy. So first, recognize what it is. Second, understand who you are. Understand who you are as a born-again believer. You have Jesus' own nature inside of you. The Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you if you are a born-again believer. You're not just an old sinner saved by grace. That's a one that we like to say all the time. Oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner. You got saved by grace. You are no longer that sinner. You deal with sin. You combat sin in our flesh throughout life, but you are no longer that sinner. You are a new creation. So get that old thing out of your mind. Oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner, but you got saved by grace. You're a child of God. That's who you are. Ephesians 2.6 says that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Get the, wrap your mind around that one time <laughs> of what that means. Hebrews 1, 2, uh, 1, 2 or no, in Romans 8, I think, Romans 8 tells us that, that we are joint heirs with Christ. Another one that makes your mind explode. What does that mean? That we are joint heirs of Christ. Well, I don't have to understand it, but I can have faith and know that that's who I am. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I am joint heirs with Christ. This is who I am. Know the power and the authority and the position that you have as a born-again believer. You are not a nobody in the kingdom. You are a powerful person because why? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So you recognize what fear is. You understand who you are. Next, you deal with it immediately. Deal with it immediately. Too many people that have let fear and worry creep into their lives little by little until they are simply used to dealing with it. They just, they just manage fear. <laughs> fear managers in their life. Every day there's something else to fear and, and they deal with that fear instead of they manage that fear instead of dealing with it. The moment you feel worry or fear, it should be like an alert or a fire alarm in your life. If the fire alarm started going off right now, nobody would just sit still, right? You'd be like, oh, we'll deal with that in about an hour. <laughs> no, you'd be hopping up, getting to it, whatever it needs to be taken care of to deal with that fire alarm. And that's what it's like with fear and worry. When you start feeling that worry come into your life right at that moment, you deal with it. You don't say, oh, I'll worry about it. I'll figure about this tomorrow. No. That moment, you immediately deal with that fear and worry. Well, 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out all fear. Cast out. Another, uh, if you study it in the, the original languages, it's like flush out. Just like when you go to the bathroom and you flush it, you take it away so you never see it again. And that's the way it was with fear and worry. You don't want to see it again. <laughs> you don't want that in your life. 1 Peter 5.5 5 tells us to cast our cares on him. What a wonderful instruction from the word, to cast our cares on him. In your prayer time, cast your cares and your worry and your fear and your unbelief and your concerns, all those things, onto Jesus. And don't take them back. <laughs> That's the most important part. Put them onto him and don't take it back. Let him deal with it. Write down what you're worried about. Here's the, the practicality. Write down the things that you're worried about. Make a list and then find a promise from the word of God that deals with that situation. And then start to speak out what that promise is instead of what that, pro that problem is. And you'll start to see answers in your life. I'm telling you. When you put the word into action, when you hold God to his word, he is not someone who's going to say, oh, I'm not going to answer that prayer or I'm not going to let them see how good I am in that situation. I'm telling you, if you hold God to his word, he will move in your life. It will happen. I've seen it time and time again in my life. Lastly, how do we get rid of worry? By walking in praise and thanksgiving. Walking in praise and thanksgiving. We saw that earlier instruction in Philippians 4 when it said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
You haven't finished putting your cares onto the Lord until you enter into praise and thanksgiving. When you've given it to the Lord from that moment forward, thank God that he's dealing with that situation and continue in thanksgiving for the answer. So often our prayers, so often my prayers is us praying to God like he has a bad memory. <laughs> like today I pray, okay, God, I, I'm, I'm dealing with this situation in my life. I'm dealing with this health situation. And the next day we pray the same thing and then pray the same thing the next day as if he forgot the first day. Right. Right. You ever think about the you know, logic of that? <laughs> God's not forgetful. Instead, we pray. We say, God, this is the situation I'm dealing with. And here's what your word says about it. And from this moment forward, I thank you, God, you're working it out. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how, when, what's going to happen. But I thank you, God, that you're working it out. The next day, thank you, Lord, you're dealing with this situation. You're dealing with this health problem. You're dealing with my son. You're dealing with my business. You just thank him from that day forward. When you give it to the Lord from that moment forward, thank God that he's dealing with the situation. And continue in thanksgiving for the answer. Praise will shut your mind up when worrisome situations arise. It's something that has become a real practice in my life. When I feel fear and worry, I just praise him. I'll sing, and I can't sing a lick. I believe, believe me, I can't. But I'll do it. I just praise God. Lord, I thank you, and I just begin to go into a song and thank him and praise him. That's when worry goes in that we read in that verse earlier, the peace that surpasses all understanding comes. When you can get into that moment, when you can get into that rest, like Hebrew tells us, that's when that peace that surpasses all understanding comes. Simply put, when you're worrying, you're not rejoicing. <laughs> they, don't go, they don't mix well together. When you're worrying, you're not rejoicing. The joy of the Lord is our strength, is what the word tells us. So when you are not in joy, you don't have that strength to fight, fight off the worry and the fear and the lies of the enemy. Take command of your thoughts. Every imagination, every thought, dream, idea, or anything else contrary to the word, whether it's healing, finances, family, whatever it is, cast it down. Make it subject to the word of God. Make it subject to Christ. I'll finish with this. Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6, if you want to turn there. Matthew 6, verse 25. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, it says this, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. This is Jesus speaking, okay? Take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet or for your body. What you shall put on is not the life that more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your Father, heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? I'm reading from the King James, if you can't notice. I like to read, I like to read from the King James. It feels like, to me, it feels like the word when you're reading, reading from the King James. And why take ye thought of raiment? Consider the, the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, nor do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, make no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that we need, ye have need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of themselves. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen. 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 Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's one we, that verse gets plucked out all the time, right? We pluck out that verse and read it by itself. When you read it in its context, what is it talking about? Worry, fear. Worrying where my food's going to come from. Worrying where my, where my clothes are going to come from. Where my family, all of these things. God is saying, if you seek him first, all these things will be added unto you. Amen. Fear has no place in our lives. Worry has no place in the life of a born-again believer. That doesn't mean you won't deal with it. That doesn't mean you won't face it, because you will. Every single hand in here would raise up if we say, yes, I, I have dealt with fear and worry. 
but that doesn't mean it has to have victory over us. Amen? Amen. Just like when we talk about, you know, the Bible tells us about sensitive subjects like prosperity and all these things. Yes, God wants to bless us, but that doesn't mean bad things won't happen to you. That means but we can walk through those things in victory. That God will guide us through those things. So if you're dealing with fear, if you're dealing with worry, the first thing, get in the Word. Read your Bible more. I spent eight years in Bible college and seminary, and the best thing I can tell you is read the Bible. Get in the Word. Make it a, a seed planted deep in your heart and in your mind so that it comes out of your mouth when you face these issues in your life. No matter how big or small the thing you face, the Word will have the answer. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that we look at your word, and yes, you dealt with huge things. You dealt with the sin of the universe. You dealt with sin and shame and Satan, but you also dealt with the things that we worry about. You were concerned about the things that cause us fear, the things that cause us worry. There is no part of our life that is forgotten by you, Lord, so we're thankful, God, that you're there with us. You're not a God that's far off. You're not a God that's left us behind to deal with things on our own, but you're a God that's with us. I pray for everyone in this place today. I pray for myself. I pray for the leaders. I pray for everyone in this place that fear would not take hold in our life, that worry would have no place in the mind of a believer. Your word says, Lord, to resist the devil and he will flee. So, Lord, we, or Satan, we resist you in the name of Jesus. You have no place in our house, in our church, in our county, in our state, in our nation. You have no place. Lord, help us, Lord. Help us to put our full trust in you. When there are things that are presented to us that the world says, yes, you should worry. Yes, you should fear. Help us to say, no, I will not worry. I will not fear. I put my trust in the Lord. If the God is for me, who can be against me? I pray for this church. I pray for everyone in here that fear would never take hold. That worry would not take hold in the future of this church, the future of the ministries, the future of the children in the Sunday school, all of these things that we would have no fear, but only faith to know that God, you are leading and guiding us. Lastly, Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that we have the word to guide us. Make us students of the word. Make us believers of the word. Make us people who act on the word. May it be deep in our hearts, deep in our minds to be able to put it into use in our life. We're so thankful, God, that you're a God that's with us. You've given us your word, so many things. And on top of that, your Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. Lord, I just thank you again. Thank you for this church and the partnership they have with the Bridge Foundation. May greater works be done in the nations of the earth because of the partnerships of the Bridge Foundation in this church. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jason. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come to the front. I just want to extend an invitation to you. We're going to stand and we're going to sing one more song. We're going to sing about that beautiful, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. And if you're here today, I want to invite you to come. If you've never experienced the beautiful name of Jesus as Savior, amen, isn't he a beautiful Savior? Saved us from our sin. We're no longer that old sinner. Now we're saved by grace. If you need to come up and be introduced into that beautiful Savior, I want you to come. Maybe you need the wonderful name. Maybe you're in that season where you just have to praise God through it. You know you've, you've casted that burden. Now you need it to stay there. You just want to come and praise Him. You need somebody to stand with you in prayer. We'd love to do that. Or maybe you need that powerful name, the name of Jesus that makes Satan flee. Stand in the power of His name. If you need to come for any reason, we invite you. Let's stand together and sing. Hello, my name is Dave, and I'm the pastor here at Antioch Baptist Church. I just want to thank you for joining us for this time of praise and worship. I hope that it impacted your life and that it inspired you to take your relationship with God 
to the next level. If you were watching today and you felt convicted by the Lord to accept Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you to make me new. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and to be my master. I believe that you rose from the dead and I believe that you are the Son of God and I believe that you will return to the earth again to take me home to be with you. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and if you responded to this message today, we'd love to hear about it. I want you to contact us here at the church and let us know about the impact that it's had on your life so that we can celebrate with you and so that we can give you some resources to help you in furthering your walk with Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. And remember to love, connect, go, and grow. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness?